Can you believe it? The Big 6-0. 60 years of amazing music here at the Monterey Jazz Festival. Grab Jeff Callahan. We're opening the curtain right now. Hey, Hammer, we're opening the curtain right now. Okay. Get my brother. Tell him they're opening the curtain right now. In 2017, we celebrated the 60th anniversary of the Monterey Jazz Festival, the world's longest running jazz festival. In honor of that, we wanted to talk to the people who make it happen, the artists, the patrons, the people behind the scenes. These are the very special people that make the Monterey Jazz Festival tick year in and year out, decade after decade. Ever since I really started to be conscious of jazz and the wider world of jazz, uh, the Monterey Jazz Festival has always, um, it's always been a, been a kind of mythic place. <laughs> I have been coming to the festival off and on for 59 years. In 1973. Since I was 13 years old. Since 1961. For 50 years. 54 years. Since the very beginning. Uh, the cream of the crop has come here consistently for 60 years. There's very few things that are as consistent in life as the Monterey Jazz Festival. But performing for a, for a, for a huge crowd of people and, and just connecting with them and sharing your music with them, it's, it's incredible. I don't know any musicians that don't love playing Monterey Jazz Festival. In many ways, to me, the Monterey Jazz Festival is family. audience. The audience is so totally into the music. You know, they're not here to be seen with stars or anything. They are into the music and there's a, a feeling of community. I'm excited to play today because I grew up here and I don't know if I'm going to know these people but it seems like some people actually have known me since I was a kid or have been following me for a long time and that's a really cool feeling. The, the appreciation of art it seems to be much higher here than many places in the country. You know, if you're an artist, if you're doing your best to express yourself, this area is a place where you can come. Everybody's having a good time. Um, and you feel that as a performer. You know, you feel people's joy, and that's a unique experience, I think, especially these days. Not only do they love the music, but they're also wonderful people to be around. You know, so uh, that's why I've always loved to hear in Monterey. So you get um, a, a respectful and attentive audience, but you also get a joyful audience. You know, people, you know, it's a, it's a big party out there. It's not just a series of concerts. You know, you come here and there's music pouring out of the buildings, coming out of, off the main stage. People are eating, they're drinking. It's just an amazing fair, jazz fair. It's, it's a family party, you know. Everybody's having a good time. Monterey is kind of setting the bar that way too. It's the best of the best. Not only are we current and doing things that represent what's going on uh, in the world today, but Monterey also has a foot in the future. Up and coming artists, cutting edge artists, um, you know, artists that are squarely within the jazz tradition, artists that may be experimenting with the relationship between jazz and other forms of music. It's always been top notch. Bless you guys for having this festival on. That's important. This is a music that, it's a living language, you know? Um, and the way you learn this language is you have to listen to it and experience it and speak it with other musicians. They're gonna want 
this kind of music in their lives because they didn't just listen to it, they touched it. Yeah, well, as musicians, we're just, we're, we're here to, to, to express ourselves, to experience joy, you know, and, uh, and to have fun. And I think a place like Monterey, it's always been, it's always been that for me. It's where I've really connected with what is joyful and, and fun about, about jazz. Those lines Those lines I've been coming to the Jazz Festival since 1961. My 49th year. 43 times. Since I was 13 years old. 50 years. Starting in 1976. 54 That's years. In our family, the third weekend in Monterey was sacrosanct. It's our high holiday. Never missed a year, no matter where I've lived and how far I had to come to get here. This particular festival impacted me so much, I had to keep coming back. My parents were at the very first one in 1958. They ended up buying out much of the front row and selling the tickets to all of their jazz musician friends. We have four generations of the jazz festival. The first night that I came down here by myself, hitchhiking, a kid, people are saying, check out Elvin Jones, or you're a drummer, oh, you should do this. So educational and, and musically communal. You know how beginning to have it, we're used to hearing certain kinds of music. I like being stretched. It's not that I don't like them, it's just maybe I'm not ready to listen to that music. I, I love being exposed to new stuff, and, and that's what I really appreciate about this generation of the Jazz Festival. I can come here, have a good time, and listen to fantastic music. To me, jazz is an emotional kind of thing. It's one of the rare musics where people are engaged and involved. I mean, it's, it's call and response in a sense. You see the audience, they're active, they're, they're whistling, and they're clock calling, and they're talking to the musicians. That's the excitement about jazz. There's no festival that you can go to that you can get this close to artists, and artists can get this close to the audience. Dizzy Gillespie would come by, sit down, and talk with you. These are giants in history. Louis Armstrong. Ray Charles, Stan Getz, the Modern Jazz Quartet, people that we had heard about on records, and then there they were in person. It's a bit overwhelming to think that we've seen these people. I teach dance and, and I will often put on a piece of music and I know exactly who this is because of being here at the Monterey Jazz Festival. The kids show on Sunday. It's the most vibrant thing you're gonna see. My favorite time is to hear these kids and they, the kids get better every year. It's just, uh, just an incredible experience. I get goose pimples listening to them. People come here to see each other. They only see once a year. So I don't care who's playing. I know it's going to be good. It's a reunion, same time next year. People you meet, you talk to them. Friends for life. No matter what, I'm going to be here. The weather, the people, the music. I just fell in love. I'm Penny Verity, the wife of the first production manager and stage manager. We were here before the festival. And welcome to the family. My name is Ernie Bile. Howard Brun. My name is Sue Dewar. Darlene Chan. Joel Wilmot. John Nichols. I'm Jim Costello. My name is uh, Clint Eastwood, and I'm uh, here uh, talking about the history of uh, the Monterey Jazz Festival. And I've been working on the festival on and off since 1962. I have been coming to the festival off and on for 59 years. I ushered, this is my usher cape, for the first 17. I am the production stage manager for the festival. I'm a board member of the Monterey Jazz Festival since 1983. And I've been involved with the festival since the very beginning. The workers here are like family. I mean, there's a connection. You're not just coming in, doing a gig, and leaving. There's still a community there, and there's still a beating heart there. And I'm lucky. I'm in one of the chambers of the beating heart. It's great fun. It's a privilege to be on the board here.
And that's the crew. And we're family. And you know, we ski together, live together, visit together. And we still do. I am probably the last of the original Monterey Jazz Festival workers who came here and worked for the late Jimmy Lyons, who was the founder and general manager of the festival. Jimmy had an idea. If you had a jazz festival in Monterey and you brought people to Monterey, it would sell. We all knew Jimmy Lyons as who he was. He was the, the man behind it all. He was the man who started it all. Jimmy was very involved in bringing in big names and you know, like Ellington. And I'll, I'll just never forget the Ellington performances. Uh, the life was incredible and the starting of the jazz festival was part of that energy and that life and burgeoning. And we were all drinkers, <laughs> sailors. Uh, it was very exciting. Jim was so crucial to, to everything that happened, but I really should talk about Tim Jackson, who I think is amazing. And Tim was a total unknown to a lot of us. And um, so there was a, a, a great deal of trepidation when he walked in the door. Tim was a new guy, fresh viewpoints, fresh musical ideas. And Tim is wonderful because he, he's kept up with what's happening. And he, he has such interesting programming. Plus he expanded the number of stages. And this festival is great because you can bring in interesting artists and important artists but not necessarily artists that draw. And then sometimes, they, lots of times, they become more recognizable and more popular because they got their start here. Tim, from our perspective, had a very similar uh, aesthetic, um, but he was bringing, he brought in younger acts and had a great feel to how to kind of roll with the changes and roll with the times. When you put yourself in the hands of a master curator like Tim Jackson or Jimmy Lyons, they are presenting you with this palette that you would be tasting, very similar to a fine chef giving you a tasting menu. Some great music and the great players have played here. And the, the history of this jazz festival has had Everybody, Dizzy Gillespie's and uh, all the greatest, uh, greatest jazz players ever uh, that, were, that were living in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, 80s, and, and so on, uh, have come and played here. And so the, the library of music is, is terrific. All right. My name is John Clayton, and I play bass, and I write and I arrange for various size ensembles, and I chase music. Being an artist in residence here at the Monterey Jazz Festival, that's a huge honor. The festival has done a remarkable job of making sure that we're not artists in residence in name only. We're very, very active with the whole idea of outreach and education. My name is Paul Contos, Education Director at the Monterey Jazz Festival. I've been a saxophone clinician and I direct the Monterey Jazz Festival County All-Star Band and I also direct the national group of high school all-star students called the Next Generation Jazz Orchestra. It's a group of the top high school jazz players anywhere in the world. It's my fourth year trying out for the band, and it's the year that I finally made it in. The time and the care and the incredible amount of effort that the Monterey Jazz Festival puts into the Next Generation Jazz Orchestra and all their education programs is so important. As a student, having that access to incredible musicians, all these different people that come in and work with us, it's it's incredible, there's no experience like it. Out of the Next Generation Jazz Orchestra, there have been a pantheon now of just wonderful players. Donnie McCaslin, Ambrose Akin Usery, Joshua Ridman, Mark Turner. It's a wonderful feeling, it's, it's a fantastic thing to just observe, you know, that 
It's those students coming through our program, some younger players I've worked with who are in New York now who are just taking off. Another example, a brilliant young flutist, flute player, Elena Pinkerton. <laughs> Jazz camp. We have students getting started in seventh or eighth grade. I've been playing trumpet since fourth grade. And they'll continue coming to camp all through high school. We have a wonderful group of interns who are alums now, uh, college age, and they went to jazz camp for about six, seven years. One of the greatest things that music has given me, especially as a young woman in jazz, it's confidence. On stage, I'm going to be part of a conversation, and when I'm up there. I've learned not to judge myself so much. You can't be creative and judgmental at the same time. One of my teachers has told me. I remember Ray Brown helping me so much. You know, here's this great bass player, and I'm, I'm a teenage kid. Finally one day I said, you've got to be tired of me always saying thank you. You do so much for me. He said, no, I'm doing this for you because somebody did it for me, and you're going to do it for somebody else. Working with the students is always a breeze because they have chosen to be curious about this music. Music is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our Saturday evening show. How's everybody doing? You had a good afternoon? All of you regulars know we do a commission piece every year. The commission artists that we have each year at the festival dates back to the very beginning. Jimmy commissioned a lot of new work in the late 50s and early 1960s. Anytime we have a legacy year, it was our 40th anniversary, we asked Gerald Wilson, and actually at the 50th anniversary, we asked Gerald again. Gerald was an incredible Southern California band leader, an NEA jazz master, a true jazz legend. He was West Coast based had a certain vibe and special feeling, but he's not with us anymore. And I immediately thought of John Clayton. He co-leads the Clayton Hamilton Jazz Orchestra with the great drummer Jeff Hamilton. And I thought of his son Gerald, who's one of my absolute favorite musicians in the world. You've got the Clayton Hamilton Jazz Orchestra here, you've got the Gerald Clayton Trio here. You've got father, you've got son. But we've got a 60th anniversary that's all about legacy and family and connection. Maybe we could put the two together. The commission piece really lets me kind of go inside my soul, you know, uh, stories of a groove. A musical groove, you know, that rhythm, that, that thing that makes you kind of want to move. That thing, that, that, that heartbeat that's in the music, that's one of the concepts that's guiding us. But as Gerald has pointed out, groove can mean a bunch of other things. Like a groove that you create in, in the couch that you sit in, you know, a real groove in the ground, a trench that you are stuck in and you can't get out of. The comfortable notion of the, the, uh, the sense of familiarity, a groove can be something we feel in our families. But then you evolve and you, you explore and the cycle of coming back home as a new person and, and with, with all that new perspective. And the conception of a groove, the evolution of the groove, and at the end of that evolution, the celebration of the life of that groove. The title does not bind us. It's freeing because I can now write something with a specific groove in mind, or I can write something that is a little bit more ethereal. I could have just written a piece and said, okay, here we go guys, play this music. But I really wanted to involve Gerald more in the whole uh, building of the piece helping me with the themes and the ideas and the textures that really reflect what his trio is about. It can start with a melody or it can start with a bass line, it can start with some harmony uh, or a rhythmic idea uh, or just a mood. Really being 
open to what the idea is sort of asking of you. You know, sometimes a musical phrase sort of dictates what, what needs to come afterwards, how much space before the next phrase, and what that next phrase is, how it's related to the first phrase. Those kinds of things are a bit mysterious and magical and based on just sort of intuition. finished the first rehearsal. Uh, first rehearsals are always packed with surprises now that I know what movements I have to, to add to this. That I make sure that those movements have the, the kind of uh, pared down thin texture that's necessary to balance the whole thing out. So my homework is that I've got to make sure that everybody's voice surfaces the way they should. And I had to remind myself, wait a minute, we're not hearing the whole thing yet. For instance, Gerald and I are right now in the process of writing a piece that will really focus on his piano together with my bass. Hear me. any reason why this festival couldn't last forever. Jazz. Mm -hmm. 